Hello and welcome to Atlantic Conversations. I'm Fanula Sweeney. The Atlantic Fellowship Programme works with a diverse community of leaders around the world with a common commitment to fairer, healthier, more inclusive societies. Through its seven programmes focused on equity and healthcare, socio-economic equity and racial equity, the Atlantic Fellowships offer those leaders an opportunity to gain new perspectives and new colleagues, while strengthening their confidence in their work for change. In each podcast, I'll be speaking to an Atlantic Fellow about their work and ambitions for a more just world. For this series, I travelled to Cape Town to meet up with some of the first Atlantic Fellows for Health Equity South Africa at Takano. Today, I'm joined by Nolotando and Lovu. Nolotando grew up in Peter Maritzburg and currently works in Durban as a researcher for Health Systems Trust, a non-profit organisation specialising in public health research and strengthening health systems. I began by asking Nolotando what had attracted her to public health. My background is actually environmental science, but I was mapping malaria. That's really when I got into public health, when I realized that I could actually do research that wasn't just for the sake of research, but research that could inform policy and actually help people. At the moment, my main thing, I think, is integrating geography and public health. A person's location has a lot of influence on the ways in which certain public health issues might affect you. That is what really interests me, understanding what influence geography has on public health issues. So with some diseases like malaria, for example, which I worked on for my master's, malaria is more of an environmental disease. So you can ascertain malaria transmission based on environmental variables like temperature, rainfall, and things like that. So you can predict that maybe the malaria season in this particular month will be greater than other months. And that then in turn has an impact on the health services that can be offered or places a greater burden at that time. Definitely. But the whole thing around that is really prioritizing because we don't have enough resources. So it's really understanding where the hotspots are for certain diseases so that we don't do blanket coverage. Maybe in a particular community, turns out that in that particular corner of the earth, there's going to be a lot of rainfall, temperature is going to be really high, so malaria is going to be extremely bad for that particular year. So we need to focus our interventions on those areas. I think for resource limited settings, especially in a country like ours, where we have a quadruple burden of disease, you really need to know where certain places are affected by certain things so that you can prioritize those people as opposed to trying to give everybody everything when we really don't have. Did you say a quadruple quadruple burden of disease? Yes. What does that mean? So in South Africa, we've got HIV, TB, maternal and child mortality, and then we've got NCDs. So those are the four things. And NCDs being non-communicable diseases. diseases. Generally, that's our disease profile. HIV levels in South Africa are quite high, particularly in the province that I'm from in KwaZulu-Natal. We've got some of the highest in Infection rates. What, mm. what area in particular are you focusing on and do you focus on a regional level or a national level? So for the organization that I work on, we produce statistics at the district level and the sub-district level, but nationally. We work a lot with the National Department of Health to produce indicators for them so that they're able to monitor and they're also able to compare which districts are doing better than others? Where do we need to focus? Also understanding context. Why is this particular district not doing as well as another when probably they're giving resources to everyone? It helps them in terms of planning to know for the coming financial year that in this particular district, for example, we really need to focus on this indicator. That indicator might be a tuberculosis success rate. And the thing of geography becomes more important again because at the national level, for example, it might seem as if things are going really well. Then suddenly you look at provincial level, you start seeing differences. Why is the Western Cape, where we are right now, doing so well, but then in the Eastern Cape, suddenly, even though they're neighboring provinces, the indicators or the performance is just not the same. Is there ever a common denominator for discovering why that is the case? Well, that's the interesting thing, which comes back to our fellowship program, where they talk about the social determinants of health. You really find that context matters in cases like these provinces are literally next to each other, but their performance indicators are not the same. You'll find that some things are related to maybe 
the way the particular government is spending their money, but also some things could be related to social determinants, maybe the education levels or the social demographic indicators of this particular people. So you would need to perhaps try to adjust those before you can actually see a difference in your health indicators. In some areas, it could purely be administrative things, but the lower you go, you start getting more nuances to say, well, we're giving everybody condoms in this particular area, but why is it that there's still such a high HIV infection rate in this particular province? And why might that be? And why might that be? You start looking a bit deeper. It could be cultural differences, educational differences, could be gender, different things could be affecting that. It's a multi-layered approach then, isn't it? That's definitely what we're realizing. It always goes back to context and how ultimately all the other factors, such as environmental factors or socioeconomic factors or political factors, actually have such a huge impact on the health system. If you look at nutrition, for example, the Department of Health is kind of collateral damage for all the other departments. So water and sanitation is not getting their act together, or the Department of Trade and Industry, for example, is doing really well because they've got a lot of investors, a lot of McDonald's are coming in to South Africa, a lot of Krispy Kremes are cropping up, but suddenly we've got this huge a burden of disease like NCDs, like diabetes and hypertension. So this particular area is mushrooming, but it's having an indirect impact on health. People are working in silos, and so there's no real intersectional collaboration between the departments. Do you foresee a situation in the near, medium, long term that will be more coordinated and integrated? We speak a lot about it in public health. There's a lot of policies, but in practice, it's actually incredibly difficult. Is that the biggest challenge you face? I wouldn't say personally, but it's definitely something that comes up a lot in the work that we do on a national scale. It's, I wouldn't say impossible, but really hard, especially when policies are not quite interlinked. So if, for example, a policy is done nationally, but then provinces have powers to either say yes to the policy or they can decline. So those kinds of governance issues come up as well. When people ask me what I do, they just think of medicine or they just think of the burden of disease. But governance also plays a huge role in how the public health system is actually functioning. Let me ask you about your personal ambitions. What first of all attracted you to this fellowship? We'd been working on a paper with another lady on food environments, and she told me about this fellowship, and I literally applied, I think, on the last day. At the time I was doing that, I felt I needed a little bit more context as to what's really informing the data, because I work with large volumes of data, just understanding what's behind the numbers. So when I read about this fellowship and I saw that it was not just academic people, but also people working for social movements, grassroots movements, it really attracted me because those are people I would never meet. I'm always very much desktop-based, crunching numbers and all of that. Now as you're graduating, what has the fellowship contributed to the work that you plan to do? More than anything, I really feel empowered in terms of how I can advocate or how I can help And also I understand that I'm part of the advocacy process. Initially, I was very intimidated by the people who worked in the civil society and the social movements because I thought, oh, wow, they're out there in the field. They're actually doing the work. They're interfacing with the communities. They're picketing. I'm just sitting in my office doing indicators. But throughout the fellowship, I really understood that I can provide the evidence to support the causes that they're fighting for. Policymakers respond to different things. So a person might respond to somebody crying, another person can feel nothing until they see that so many people are dying and that this indicator is doing this poorly. So now I see myself as an activist as well and not just somebody who's on the outside looking in. Now I see the impact that I can have through the work that I do by crunching those numbers for those people who are actually working in the communities and being part of that process to influence change. You're joining an Atlantic community of fellows from seven programs. Have you thought about that at all in terms of how that might help or impact your work in South Africa and vice versa, that you might be able to help a fellow in another country in their role? I really think that's possible. Just from the communication that we've had with them and the interactions that we've had with people from the other programs, I've learned so much. We met the people from the racial equity program last year, and that alone changed my whole outlook, trying to understand how does race fit into the health issue. And then you meet people from global brain health. You're just old. That's why you have dementia. 
but now I know, no, <laughs> it's way deeper than that. So it's really broadened my horizons in terms of understanding, even though we're a middle income country, how we fit into the bigger scale of things. Also just learning what's worked in other places without reading a journal, speaking to somebody about something as opposed to downloading an article and reading about it. It has way more insight and understanding. I think if maybe if I'd read about dementia, I wouldn't feel that I actually understand what it's about. Now I can actually explain to somebody that dementia is caused by other things than just being old. Well, congratulations on becoming a senior fellow and a member of the Atlantic Fellows Thank Community. You. Thank you so much. That was Nolatando and Lovu, Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity South Africa at Takano. For more information, you can visit www.atlanticfellows.org. I'm Fanula Sweeney, and you've been listening to the Atlantic Conversations podcast.